Welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach, and the return of a very special guest that I'm excited to listen to this episode because we're going to be talking about something that's near and dear to my heart. So I'm going to turn it over to you, David, and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, thanks. Okay, well, um, we're going to get real about AI from two grizzled vets uh, who have seen tech boom and bust after tech boom and bust and aren't swooning about the latest and greatest gizmos. Our returning champion is top copywriter, copy chief, and publishing exec, Aaron Gensler. Aaron knows his way around the written word, AI, and the tech community behind AI. I'm the other grizzled vet. I know you're going to think I'm old when I say this, but I was making a living writing before there was an internet. Now, Aaron and I had a frank, casual conversation last week about AI, what's real and what's ridiculous. And we came up with such good practical ideas for anyone who writes copy or uses copy in their business that we decided to expand our conversation into a show today. Before we do, let me expound on this. Copy is powerful. You're responsible for what you hear in this podcast, and most of the time, common sense is all you need. But if you make extreme claims, and if you're writing copy for offers in highly regulated industries like health, finance, and business opportunity, you may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. So, Aaron, great to see you again, and uh, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me back. I was uh, I was blown away, uh, in, in a way, by the conversation you and I had last week. We were just catching up. It had been some months since we spoke, and all of a sudden, it's half an hour has gone by, and we're talking about AI and how to use it and what's good and what's bad and what are the opportunities. So I'm glad that you invited me back. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Let's talk about the way most people use AI and I guess this gets a little meta or um, a little intellectual, but the assumptions behind it. Um, I, I'll, I'll dive into the assumptions in a second, okay? You, you said something very interesting about um, using AI to write a, a piece of crap just to get you started as opposed to staring at a screen. Yep. Yeah, the the conversations that we've been having in our business, there was actually a colleague that said it to me some, some weeks ago first, was you do all the research, you feel as though you prepare, and then sometimes no matter your best efforts or how much preparation you've put in, you're staring at the blank document, you're staring at the cursor, and you have ideas in mind, but it's just not popping out onto the page yet. I've found, and I've, I've, I've spoken to other people too, that they're using... They're using AI, a set of data, a set of assumptions, of prompts to create a completely terrible, unworkable, low, very low bar first draft. It's not anything close to what you're going to publish. It's not anything close to what's going to meet live fire, but it at least gets you moving. And if it's just 5% of the work of beginning to create the first draft to bring the idea forward, to bring the idea to life, AI is useful in that sense. And you look at as recently as six months ago, AI was, it was going to, it was going to eliminate jobs. It was going to do all this work for us. It was going to be the, the invention that, you know, it was going to, it was, it's the singularity in a way, because now there's a, an intelligence that sits over top of human effort and it combines forces and it's going to bring all these. And like you and I talked about last week, that's all probably going to happen at some point. We're just nowhere near that right now. So it's a tool. It's a hammer. And with, with in, 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 the, in the hands of an amateur, that hammer can be very dangerous. And it can lead you down roads that lead <laughs> nowhere good. And in the hands yeah. of a skilled craftsman or someone, or someone who knows how to utilize that tool, AI today, as it exists, even though it will get better, and, you know, there's the issues with Gemini this week and, you know, Matt Taibbi's piece recently. Like, it, there, there are... There are terrible and drastic downsides to the AI as it's been presented to us thus far and what's available. But if you're smart, if you're tactical and you're using it the right ways, my belief is it, it has a lot of potential as well. And we should be we should be leaning into that. Yeah, I agree. I remember 
back around the turn of the century, at right, right at the height, maybe at the beginning of the dot-com boom before the dot-bomb, um, there was this guy on, on a national TV uh, news show who said, every business has to be on the internet. Physical businesses will cease to exist. And he was dead serious. And they were giving him national publicity. And that would mean that the corner store a block from me um, that sells candy and cigarettes uh, cannot exist. And yet it does. How could that be? You, you were reminiscing how um, VSLs were going to put an end to HTML sales letters. Yeah. Well, yeah. They, they haven't. And some people say VSLs don't work anymore. So, you, you know, uh, it, it's, it's crazy. It, now, I have, a, I have a whole other way of looking at it. And uh, did, I, did I tell you about the Winston Churchill method of writing? Uh, I believe you mentioned it, but go ahead. It's, I, it's I, as I remember, it's worth it's worth saying again. So go ahead, please. Yeah. So don't know if this is actually true, but there's a story that the way Churchill would write, was he would get drunk, he would get naked, he would get in the bath, and then his secretary would come in and he would dictate. So there's an interesting thought. He he didn't give his secretary a prompt and say, "Hey, write me." 500 words in my voice, he he told her what he wanted to say. And what I've been experimenting with and having great success with is figuring out how to get the AI to ask me one question at a time. Now, coming up with the questions is important and knowing how to get AI to do something. Most people aren't even good at following in, instructions exactly. So giving exact instructions is probably hard too. But um, what I found, I was able to create five little chunks for um, a podcast, a guy, another podcast, a guy invited me on um, using that pretty much with the responses I gave. Now, I've got an advantage. I've been writing professionally for half a decade. Um, and I teach people and I coach people and yada, 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 yada. Um, but I still think it's important for the writing to be in, in your voice and not the AI's voice. Now, I saw a few things after we talked and before this podcast, I mean, after we talked last week and before today on, on Twitter that I thought were fantastic and really important. So there's Paul Graham and he's, um, you know, Y Combinator. He was really big in Silicon Valley. He's also an author and quite a good writer. And he has this sort of droll British comment um, in that he's British and droll. Uh, current AIs have solved, at least solved the problem of watermarking AI generated answers. Watermarking meaning identifying it so you'll know that it's AI generated. Their bland double speak is nothing like a normal human would write. And he says, here's the real problem though. Most people find writing hard and will get AIs to do it for them whenever they can get away with it, which means bland double speak will become the default writing style. Ugh. Well, as you know, copywriters, we can't afford that. Yeah. That's the opportunity. I'm glad that you put it that way that you, that you read that. Cause that's the opportunity. So some months ago, it was oh my god, we're gonna all the juniors are gonna be gone and legal and you know all the all the fears and everything that was out there. And again, to a certain extent, that may be true. But I, I, I keep I keep saying this: people that are in the business right now, people that understand ethical persuasion, people who understand true emotional connection, people who understand how to reach across time and space with with the with the with the words and the offers and putting putting the right ideas in the right order, people who understand what it takes to actually compel conversion, to, 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 main, to capture and maintain interest are gonna be just fine because the, the double speak, the, the blank, the mashed potatoes that you get out of AIs on, on you know, improper prompting or however you wanna say it, it's not gonna, it's not gonna convert. And again, I, I understand I'm taking a risk here, but it's not gonna convert on, on mass scale anytime soon because an artisan, a, a craftsperson, a person who understands, the, like I said, the true techniques of persuasion is going to have an advantage for a significant period of time. 
And I, I say that, I say that fully recognizing just how powerful a, a tool and innovation this will become and, and the, the, the assistance that it will give many industries, ours, ours included, of course. Um, but you said something else a second ago too. I just, I just want to go back to about like the t- turn of, uh, uh, turn of the millennium where it was, you know, if your business isn't online, we're not going to have a business. And then you mentioned the the shop, you know, down the corner that sells, you know, sundries. And I think, I think during times of, and again, I'm no expert, but I've, I've worked in tech and I've worked, I've worked with tech gurus for, for many years. And the, something that I've heard, and I think moments like this is an important moment to recognize it, pay attention to it, is that during times of, technological upheaval the everybody vacates the middle and we go to these polar opposite views this is either the best thing that's ever happened or the, oh my god this is the most this is the most frightening potentially destructive thing that's ever happened but then you look back on tech adoption as these as these moments of upheaval begin to make their way into society and you can say you know, broadband internet, uh, 5G technology, the, the internet itself, whatever, however you want to frame it. Technology has a tendency to be additive over time and not necessarily be a process of elimination. There are eliminations that take place, of course, right? Which increases efficiency, increases wealth potential. And you know, overall, these many of these tech advances that we look back on were, were enorm- enormously additive for productivity, for happiness, for wealth. And if we can all kind of just keep our heads, you know, together here and keep our heads screwed on straight during these early phases, these early steps of AI, I think we'll get to that point as well. It's the, the danger for me right now is expecting, like you said, expecting too much of it, expecting it to be too good, too fast, because that's where we're going to get ourselves in big trouble and we're going to miss chances to, in our case, connect with prospects. Yeah, um, really, really good point. Um, really good points. And there's one other thing I saw on Twitter I want to throw out. And this is from Mark Andreessen. He invented, co, co-created, co um, what was it called? Mosaic, which was like the first graphic internet browser. And now he's talking about something I really don't want to get into because it's very political and 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 very loaded and he, he's so what he's going to be talking about here is gemini and some of the stuff that's come out of there that where they think it might be politically incorrect to um criticize genghis khan right i mean yeah. it's just like geez. um but but think about this from the point of view of writing he says i know it's hard to believe but Big tech AI generates the output it does because it is precisely executing the specific ideological, radical, biased agenda of its creators. It's also true that um, AI is writing as it was programmed to write. And you can train it all you want, but there's an underlying way of writing and way of thinking that's built into it that I don't think you can change. So I think if you can get AI to pull words out of you by just having a conversation like you were texting or something, um, I think you'll get better results. Well, let, let I, I want to, you know, we had a really interesting conversation. I have a strong interest in film, drama, screenwriting. You have a background in it a master's degree in screenwriting. I think you've acted in movies. So you kind of understand that world. And I saw something on, I I think it's a really good show. It's been going for 25 years, um, Law and Order SVU. And uh, it's two minutes. I'm going to read you the dialogue and describe it. And I have a couple questions. One is, could AI ever write this? And two is, do you think an AI could understand it? Because I found nine objectives. Some of these objectives come out of playwriting drama 101. Some of them are a little more subtle. Let me let me just go yeah. through it. Um, sort of fun. And it, it all revolves around a plate of freshly made, beautiful, plump, colorful donuts. 
All right. And it's the second scene of the show. You're in the, the break room where they eat. There's a plate of beautiful, colorful donuts on the table. And Finn, who's the kind of tough guy investigator, walks up to another guy named Velasco. And he says, Velasco, since when do you make donuts? Velasco, I don't. And a woman named Curry walks into the room. She says, I made them. She extends her hand to introduce herself to Velasco. Renee Curry, Velasco, Joe Velasco. Finn walks in and says, accusingly, Curry's IAB. You know, IAB, the uh, cops on the cops, the internal in, in mm -hmm. affairs bureau. And Curry says, used to be. I hope Benson told you that I was joining the squad. And Finn says, I imagine that took some string pulling. Curry says, yeah, it did. Finn says, aren't you a captain? Curry says, look, I'm not interested in pulling rank around here, and I was hoping we could be, Finn says, what? And she says, friends. And Finn says, I don't make friends with internal affairs, but I am going to eat one of your donuts under pro under protest. And, and so he picks it up, and she says, I can respect that. And then he gets in her face. He says, well, respect this. I got Benson's back. First, last, and always. Benson is his boss, is the head of the department, and the one who Curry was investigating before she found Benson was clean as a whistle and decided to join the squad. So you can see all the dramatic tension, all the all this stuff going on, right? Um, so Finn walks out of the squad room, holding the donut on a napkin. He hasn't taken a bite, and then Finn walks right up, gets in his boss's face, Benson, and says, when were you planning on telling me about Curry? And Benson says, I gave you the heads up. Finn says, you did? Benson says, yeah, I did, Finn. You don't listen. And I got approval, so don't worry. Finn says, from? And Benson says, McGrath, who do you think? And Finn says, he did you one last favor before he stepped down. Benson walks up to Finn, takes the donut out of his hand, and says to him, how come you never bring me baked goods? Finn says, why is there another captain here? Benson says, because Curry needed a change. Finn then makes a reference to a detective who left, a woman, Amanda Rollins. And he says, and you needed a Rollins. And Ben says, Curry's looking to prove herself not as a captain and not as an IAB suit and certainly not as a replacement for Amanda. And then she starts to bite into the donut. And Finn says, and she actually wants to be an SVU investigator. I don't have to take orders from her. Benson says, no, but you have to be nice to her. And then there's a pause, and she's staring into this cardboard box and just ruffling through it. And Finn says, what are you doing? And she goes, I know, I know. I haven't been myself in weeks. And then someone rushes in with an urgent message and change of scene. Believe me, it's a lot more entertaining when you see the actors do it than my table read. But the scene is two minutes, 350 words of dialogue. And here's what you get when you're watching it. You learn Curry's name. She's a new member of the squad. We're also reminded of the names of the regular characters. That's something you're taught to do in a play. Um, Velasco, Finn, Benson, and their other characters referred to. We find out that Finn is suspicious and feels threatened. He's insecure. Now, I want to stop on number three there because... In an AI, you would have, if he's writing dialogue for Finn, and we'll talk about this in a minute more, he said, I'm suspicious. What's going on here? But he didn't do it that way. He demonstrated by his actions, and it seemed very natural, and you learn about his character, and it's entertaining because people are like, do that kind of stuff in real life. Four, we find out Benson likes donuts enough to take a fresh donut right out of Finn's hands. Five, we find out, how Curry transitioned from IAB. Six, we found out Curry doesn't get to order Finn around, even though she's a captain, but the way Benson runs her group, and this is so important emotionally, she expects everyone to get along. I mean, there's some people have a team of rivals idea, not her. She wants everyone to get along. Seven, we found out Benson is going through some kind of crisis, doesn't know what to do. Eight, the donuts are beautiful, plump, colorful, and have sprinkles. And symbolically, they do a lot of work. First, the whole cops and donuts thing. 
But secondly, yep. they show Curry is making a peace offering after being an IAB bad guy before. And <laughs> third, we find out Finn wants the donut more than he hates IAB. So he says he'll take the donut under protest. And number 11, when Benson takes the donut out of Finn's hand and takes a bite out of it, we find out that she's the boss. Now, to me, that's some great screenwriting. Okay. Um, and it was all in two minutes. Now, I b- before we, we talk about the, the one thing that, that you and I really found so important, um, not only for screening, but for copywriting, um, I, I had the scene transcribed on Otter AI. And Aaron, you told me there was a summary tab, which I did not know about. And you just, you're not used to seeing it. And so a, Otter AI did an automatic summary without even me asking of this scene. Uh, you want to hear what it is? It's not going to take very long. Yeah, donuts, go ahead. curry, donuts, curry, and rank in a police squad. Squad. Unknown speaker makes donuts for a curry, sparking a conversation about rank and respect. No. The, the 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 big the big problem with AI both in writing and in analyzing stuff, and this is more in copywriting and certainly in fiction and drama than it is in business in left brain logical stuff is the combination of context and emotion and implication the underlying stuff versus on the nose stuff. That's what I was talking about when I said you wouldn't have Finn saying, I'm suspicious, what's going on here? I'm feeling a little insecure, right? You wouldn't have him say that. Yeah. Yeah. There's has there's so many different points at which the tension rises and then there's a denouement of some kind. There's a, someone wants something, someone wants to understand something, someone wants to write. It, inside that two minute scene that you read, I mean, that's the dramatic structure, right? You know, there, there's yeah. an inciting incident, rising tension. There has to be a resolution. You exist on the other side of that in a plane that you were not in before. But therefore, the story continues, right? Something else is at stake. Something else is bigger, right? So you could, like, from a programmatic standpoint, you could give AI that information and it could give you some possibly okay representation of that. But then when you just summarize the dramatic structure of what took place, there was donuts, there was a conversation. We talked about friendship and respect and trust, and right? So... The, I don't, this is deep. Like the, the way I like to use a summary of, for me, useful exercise of summary in some of these, some of these platforms is you and I are having this conversation. I take the, I take the audio it's, it's listening in the background. Right. And then it gives us, it gives us a transcript and a summary afterward. And it's like, these were, these were David's major points on X, Y, Z. This is what Aaron had to say about ABC. And then I can be like, okay, now I can file that away and I can refer to it without going back through and watching the entire conversation that David and I had. I like to use it to confirm what I'm thinking about in the summary functions of these two. I like to use it to confirm in the moments immediately following that what it's giving me conforms to my own understanding of the conversation that just took place. If it is, it kind of gets the check mark. I save it, I paste it in, I save it. And I'm like, I can always go back to that because I trust that it's an accurate representation of what of what David said, what his points were, what I felt like I had to contribute to the conversation. Yeah, but you, I mean, you just like to to ask it to understand the subtlety, the nuance, and the 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 moment that the performer brings. To, and this goes for persuasion too. Like on a page, like when the how the how the proof points line up to get me to the point where I'm nodding along, and now I'm ready. Now you're ready for my wallet, right? Now I'm like, oh my god, I finally get it. Yes, I must have X Y Z product. That it's just not there. And maybe someday it will be, but we're not, we're not there yet. And I think the, what you just did, that exercise, it's a perfect representation of how far we have to come. So we respect it, we use it, but we realize how far we have to go. Thanks. And, you know, if, if you take chain of beliefs or chain of logic, it's the same thing. You can, you can like, map it out as very surface level, explicit, conscious, rational points, but actually executing it that takes some craft that takes some some emotional experience um uh, um you know ima- imagination uh, understanding of how conversations really work including the conversation 
in your prospect's mind. AI can't do that part. But 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 like you said, it, it's a huge time saver in terms of taking a large mass of material and extracting the key points and outlining the structure, which is a different kind of job and very important for a copywriter, very important for a product creator. I mean, you were telling me about a, a product you're working on, which we'll, we'll be talking about again in a few weeks. And you had hours of transcripts that you needed to have summarized and you were able to do that quickly with AI, right? Yeah, the uh, the project that Sean Twing and I uh, are working on and uh, as a follow on to the two offers that we put out last year, um, tens of thousands of words of content and, and the, the images that we've shown in, the, in these lesson modules that we've created. And I want as a teacher is not the right word, but as to helping helping people write better copy, helping people and you know this, you and I talk about this helping people write better copy, think more clearly about their offers. I want to be able to go back when I was in a, when I was in one of those live training environments with folks who, who had, who had paid real money for our advice and analysis. I wanted to make sure day over day, module over module that number one, what I said made sense. Number two, that it landed well. And number three, that I could take what I had already said and continue to build on it to help those people continue to progress, to continue to, to build new skills. And it was enormously helpful for me to have like immediate return, like these summaries that I'm talking about, and then to be able to compare it. Like it, need, it needs, this is an important point. It's the tools that are available right now are not completist. They cannot do work for you, but they can supplement the quality of your work that you're already doing. So with human review, with a check, right? I can be like, oh, it, I'm really, I really appreciate that it pointed that out to me that I spent two minutes back there an hour and a half ago talking about X, Y, Z, because that's something I can build on in the next one. So yeah, Sean and I, we've been, we've been experimenting with these tools and he, he even more than I, he's a, he's a savant with some of this stuff. He's had some fantastic breakthroughs with some of these tools. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I don't ask it to do any, I guess the good way to sum it up is I'm not asking any of these tools to do anything I'm not already doing myself. And I'm not asking it to do anything that I'm not then sitting over top of and checking a hundred percent for, for, for accuracy and an accurate representation of what I intended. Yeah. Let me, let me drill down on one thing you said, cause I think it's so important and um, you didn't gloss over it, but I just want to, explore it a little more. Um, so you say you're, you're giving a class or you're doing a, a session and you want to make sure that, you know, what you say made sense and you covered all the points you wanted to cover and so forth. So you feed the audio into a transcriber and then you feed the transcription into an AI that, um, summarizes it for you and breaks it down to bullet points and so forth. So casually you could say, well, I'm just using AI for quality control, but you're not. You're the one who's doing the quality control. You're not asking AI, hey, in your infinite knowledge and wisdom, could you tell me, did I say what I should have said? And did I miss anything? No, you're the one who's doing that. You're using AI to put it in a form so you can do that. But if you depended on AI to do that, it might not do a very good job and it might inject some kind of bias that you don't want into there. That's exactly right. I'm glad that you brought that. You brought a specific highlight to that because I, that's a good way to, to, to encapsulate it. Now, now think about that as a research model. If I'm out there and I'm, I'm conducting interviews to learn more about a prospect universe, I'm talking to uh, the, 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 I don't know, the manufacturing team at XYZ factory that makes the widget that I'm supposed to try to figure out how to sell, right? Any kind of research like that, if I'm using the tools to benefit my, my, my further learning and understanding of what it's going to take for me to successfully position this and do my job, but I'm sitting over top of that process. I'm the one who's actually farming the takeaways. 
and making sure, like like you said, you said it better than now I'm going on a different road. But yeah, the, the, the ultimate copy, the ultimate quality control has to rest with the creator. You cannot ask the tool to do something in a completest sense for you because it is not capable. I like to boil it down to a bumper sticker. Don't let the AI do your thinking for you. That's your job. You know, it, it can do a lot of a lot of the scut work, but you print, you got to do thinking. Print that. Get that. Get that bumper sticker printed. Get that on your Etsy shop. That's a business right there. Don't let the AI fill in the blank. Don't let it do this. Don't let it do that. I think we got a business. We just I, mean, one. I, don't, I don't know. It that that would be kind of like in in Baltimore putting out a bumper sticker that says don't eat crabs they're bad for you yeah yeah the, the, the crab lobby in baltimore i, I live in san francisco that would be very dangerous to my health i don't know if i could do that but maybe i will watch out we'll see uh, uh, yeah no i i get excited i get excited talking to people just catching up with folks like folks in the industry or people in different niches what, what are you doing how are you using it what are you seeing like what are your wins and losses yeah. with it so far and then I just yeah. like, and they're like, oh, we had this project and we tried this and we tried that. It was a disaster. It was like, but then we went back and at the end we were pretty happy because we got this result, you know? And I think it's, it's going to be so much, it's going to be so much trial and error, probably a lot more errors in many of those trials, but we'll get there. And, you know, two years, three years, five years from now, it's going to fundamentally transform so many businesses. And that's going to be great because it's going to increase opportunity. And I'd like to think I refuse to be, I, I refuse to vacate the middle. I'm not going to sit here and say that, oh my God, AI is going to da 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 da. And I'm also not going to lose any sleep over it, but it's, oh, I'm, I'm going to be out of a job. You know, no, I'm going to, I'm going to play it as, you know, play the AI cards that are dealt to us in this industry and other industries, other things that we do. I'm going to try to learn from it. I'm going to try to be strategic about how I deploy it and learn with the curve as it progresses. I think that's the best any of us can do. Yeah, I think so too. And um, to play with your metaphor a little bit, I, th I think you should play the cards that you're dealt, but I think you should set the rules of the game, not AI. Yep. And, yep, and yep. you know, I mean, I think too many people think of AI like this deity or this all-knowing genie. And it's not. It's a very sophisticated, clever computer program with access to lots of information and resources. But it's, you know, if you look at the number of neurons in the human brain and you do a factorial, which is a complicated math thing that I can't, don't know how to explain, but if you, means if you connected every neuron in every combination, I don't think any AI is going to come close to that for a long time. That's my Quantum computer. Nathan, Quantum. Nathan, hey. you love this topic. What do you think? Where are you? Please, please rejoin us. Oh, my God. Did AI um, <laughs> kidnap him? Uh, no, there he is. I'm going to say 10 years from now when the AI has complete control of everything and it goes back through the Internet archives looking for dissenters, um, we're all going to yeah. be off to the AI gulag. But <laughs> uh, I, I agree with most of it. I will say, though, um, David, you and I have worked on some things behind the scenes on using AI to go over our copy and help us improve it, help us check for things that maybe we, we didn't see because we were stuck in the frame. And for me, that has been one of the one of the best uses. I'm still creating the copy. I'm still writing the copy, but training it to go through and look for things that I might have missed is is a it, very it, valuable it, use it, of it it's true but do you retain the option to reject its suggestion that's oh, sort of the key question absolutely and you can see the copywriters and business owners that are not taking that option and you can look at it and as a as a copywriter we can spot it right away but i think the readers the prospects they might not spot some of the things that we are spotting but they intuitively know it and i think that they feel it I, yep, and it causes red flags that these copywriters that are relying on it completely might not know that they're setting off. Yeah, well, um, AI user beware. I was trying to figure out how to translate in, that into Latin, but, you know, I don't know Latin, <laughs> so I can't do that. Let's ask the AI. 
So um, Aaron, um, tell us a, a little more about your your new product, and I know you're coming back to tell us a lot more about it in a few weeks. But tell us. Yeah, yeah the two, the two. Thank you, thank you for for asking. Um, the the two projects that Sean and I did last year. Uh, the first was called Offer Essentials Masterclass. It was how to be strategic in the frameworks that you choose when you're like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put out an offer. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pursue my dream of solopreneur, or my my small business that I've been working on on the side. How do I, how do I put something out there that helps me put my business's best foot forward? So that was the first program that we did. It's about seven hours of content. Second one was called Sales Page Essentials. Uh, that was cold cold audiences, warm audiences, hot audiences, what we would call front end versus back end offers. And we pulled, we pulled pages apart from a variety of different niches. What makes great offers stand out? What makes, how do you, how do you, how do you use these copy tech, just basic street level technique of persuasion, copy technique to make your offer number one, convert number two, stand out from everything else that's out there. So those are the two that we have in the can. Uh, the one that we have coming up, uh, by the end of April, it's called F3. We're calling it Full Funnel Formula. That's where three Fs, F3. And it's a it's sort of a culmination of now you've under, you've you've gained an understanding of the frameworks and structures that can make an offer work. And we've looked at actual styles of copy that could be appropriate for a variety of, of, of product or service types. So now how do you put those pieces together? How do you put them to get uh, fulfillment and retention structures in place? How do you, well, uh, what's a, What's a, what's a funnel? If you're starting with a $49, $79, $129 offer, what's a funnel structure that makes sense that you can ascend those people quicker and give them better, better experience? These are the things we're going to dive into with Full Funnel Formula. That's a, it's going to be a live uh, eight-week training. It's going to take place over the spring. So, yeah, we're, uh, we're deep in development right now, and I appreciate you letting me talk about it for a minute because Sean and I both are very, very excited about what, what we could do with this one. Yeah, I'm excited to find out more about it, but uh, it's not available, so all we can do is tease. We can't offer, so we'll, we'll have to wait until it's ready, and then, then maybe you can come back. Thank you. I appreciate it. In the meantime, if our listeners dug this interview and they want to find out more about you, Aaron, where's the best place to connect or uh, find out more about you? I'd say uh, email me, aarongensler at gmail.com. Happy to hear from anybody. Happy to hear from anybody. Happy to have a conversation. I appreciate the feedback. Awesome. I just want to say thank you for coming on and having a rational discussion about AI. The uh, polarization is definitely thick out there, and we need more uh, grounded and not so polarized discussions about this going on. So I appreciate you coming on and doing that with us today. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. All right. And if you enjoyed this episode and you want to check out more, head on over to copywriterspodcast.com. 360 plus episodes over there so far and uh, a wealth of knowledge that will definitely give you an advantage over the AI (laughs) when it comes to your copywriting. And until next time, we will catch you later. Catch you later. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Always a good time.